Thank you and hello and welcome to this session on Effective Challenge. My name is Hannah Stolton and I'm the CEO here at Governors for Schools. It's a really popular topic. We've had lots and lots of people register for this one. And as mentioned, it is one of our CPD accredited sessions. I'm joined today by two experienced professionals in the governance field. You may have heard them speak before. We have Saren Warmington, who is Head of Education Governance Solutions, and Jeff Marshall, who is an Academy Conversion Specialist. Both of them are experienced governors as well, so we'll bring lots of uh, stories about their own experiences to the table. I'll start off by giving them the chance to introduce themselves and then ask them what effective challenge looks like for governing boards and how we can assure it is happening. As I said, please put in questions into the chat that you have as we talk. Um, but over to you, I'll start with you, Sharon, your top left for me. Um, good morning. Um, thank you for inviting me to, to um, this event. And um, thanks to those who have joined this particular session. So my name is Sharon Warmington. I am um, the Director of Education Governance Solutions. And within that brand, I um, look after different um, organizations um, and brands, one being the National Black Governors Network, one being the Governors Podcast, um, also the National Association of School and College Clerks. I'm corporate governance trained and I work across all sectors in terms of governance, but my heart is in education. So yeah, I'm also a, a school governor in a maintained primary and a MAT trustee. So yeah, I live and breathe governance. You're on mute, Hannah. Thank you, yeah, elementary. Thank you, Sharon. Over to you, Jeff. Uh, thank you, Hannah, and uh, good morning, Sharon. Um, so my name is Jeff Marshall, and my background is banking and finance, um, but I've been a governor for 30 years. I've been chair of governors for 23 years, at one of the first primaries to become an academy. So we were one of the first five primaries to become an academy. So we've been an academy now for nearly 13 years. I'm one of the three trust members there. I'm also the chair of trustees. I'm also a trust member of a four school multi academy trust. For the last 13 years, I've run a company. I own a company that converts schools to academy status. We've now converted 288 schools to academy status. We support over 50 multi academy trusts in areas such as growth audits, MAT MOTs, how a multi academy trust operates after they've opened. We have a due diligence, two due diligence functions and we have a map merger and transfer service. My second company is a CPD training and coaching company. We're a registered center for the Chartered Management Institute, delivering level five and level seven coaching leadership and management courses. I was a national leader of governance for eight years. I mentor chairs, train governance and review governance. I have a dubious honor of conducting 117 external reviews of governance. And it is as exciting as that sounds, but Sharon and I will actually find that exciting. <laughs> Um, I, I am also a fellow of the Charter Governance Institute and I do uh, governance work and uh, training in the corporate sector. I'm on a big trip at the moment trying to uh, join up corporate governance with educational governance because I think we can both learn from each other and we can leave the place better than we found it. And I'm also a fellow of the Charter Management Institute. And I, uh, as I say, I do corporate governance work. Um, my, my uh, Academy Conversion Company was voted Academy Conversion Provider of the Year 2022. And this year, my uh, CPD Coaching Company uh, was voted the Corporate Governance Training Provider of 2023. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> we have so much experience between you. Amazing. <laughs> we need to leave. <laughs> <laughs> so what does effective challenge look like then? Come on. <laughs> so, um, I'll get in before Jeff then. Um, for, for me, I think, and I've just to contextualise this a bit more, um, I've been in, govern in governance all of my working life. Um, in, the, in the private sector, I started as PA to the CEO and board secretary um, for, a, for a private company. Um, and I didn't move into education governance until I became a parent governor um, about 20 years ago. Um, plus. So um, that was my first look at, at governance. And at the time, I didn't really understand my role. The world has shifted significantly, I'm glad to say, in terms of governance. But the way I look at challenge, I replace the word challenge with question. Um, what 
effective questioning. What questions can I ask that is going to clarify my understanding or the understanding of the, the governing board or the situation? Or what questions can I ask that is going to um, lead us to a decision um, um, or give us more information on what we're looking at? And so I think the effective challenge is how effective are your questions and are those questions aimed at moving you forward so that they're not accusatory, they're not confrontational, but they are, um, challenge doesn't have to be negative, um, but it can be difficult sometimes. Um, and that can be shifted just in the way in which the question is posed, in my opinion. So when I'm preparing for a meeting, I will read the papers and make sure that I've got at least one question per paper, um, you know, that I can ask. And it doesn't mean I'm going to ask all of those questions, but it does mean that I'm prepared to ask a question. Um, and I think that that's, in, that's important. Uh, Sharon, I think what you just said there, you could take the word right out of my mouth. Everything that you just said, I absolutely agree with. Uh, for me, effective challenge is, is about questioning and it's about what an effective question is. And for me, effective question and an effective challenge is, is one that gives you the information that you can use to make a better decision. So it doesn't matter what that question is, as long as it gives you the information to make a better decision. Because I think what we all agree here, what we all will agree on the call, is the more information you have, the better the decision-making you make. And better decision-making leads to better outcomes for children. So I completely agree with you. Challenge should not be negative. It should not be deemed confrontational. I have never, ever, and I argue with the DfE and the National Governors Association many times on this, I have never approved of the phrase critical friend. I don't, I think it's self-limiting critical friend. Personally, this is my personal belief. When I've been training governors for th three decades, I, I, I say a governor is watchdog, mediator, and champion. A critical friend is one small element of those three. We are watchdog, we do hold to account, but it's not a negative holding to account. Sometimes we can ask a question which is a clarification question or a confirmation question, and it is effective challenge. We mediate because that's what governors do in any walk of life, we mediate and champion because what we don't do in this country is champion what we do really well. We tend to look at the negative. Governing board, board bodies tend to meet uh, outside of the normal diary system if there is a problem. If someone's put a complaint in, what we don't do is say, do you know, we're really good at what we do here and what we should be doing is championing it. And Sharon knows what I mean by that. We should be saying the good things about how we leave the place better than we found it. In governance, I can sum up in eight words it usually, is our job is to leave the place better than we found it. It doesn't matter what function we hold, but effective challenge is getting the information to make a better decision, which leads to better outcomes. And it shouldn't come across as confrontational negative or, a or, 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 or encompassed and limited to a phrase called a critical friend. I think uh, I, I, like, I like that a lot, Jeff, and I've written down watchdog, mediator and friend. Um, definitely. Champion. Watchdog, mediator, champion. Champion. Um, I think it's important that we also understand that challenge is not limited to the governing board meeting. Absolutely. And, you know, it's important that um, we involve ourselves in um, stakeholder engagement, that whilst we are on our mm. visits, that we are challenging um, the, the, um, the people that we meet. We are challenging the children in terms of our questioning so that we are interrogating and making sure, interrogating in a nice way though, not, <laughs> um, you know, and making sure that we're not, what we're hearing at the, um, at the meeting is being reflected in the school. And if we don't have that, that triangulation, so what, what the papers are telling us, what the senior leaders are telling us, and then what the school through the teaching staff, through the children is telling us, and all of that links together, then how can we really um, know that we're doing a good job? Um, you know, if the decisions that we've made are not being implemented, why are they not? Why is a brilliant question to, to ask, even in its simplicity? Why are we doing that? That can change the, di the, the trajectory of something we could be going down one route and, a, and a, governor, a governor could say, well, why are we doing this? 
rather than assuming that we're all on board. Um, and it doesn't mean that they're disagreeing with the way um, the decision um, that's on the table, but they're just challenging and making sure that we have explored other options if necessary, or do we really need to do it now? One of the favorite things that my coach likes to say to me is just because you can, should you? Um, you know, and that's a, um, something that helps me to reflect on whatever decisions I'm making in my business. Just because I can do it now, is it the, is it the right time to do it now? Or do I need to park it and revisit it next term or next year? So I think that um, is really important as, as, as well. Uh, Sharon, I think you've just raised something there, which actually even op opens the discussion even bigger, even, even wider. When, when uh, We don't induct governors properly in this country. We haven't for decades. Um, for me, induction should be twofold. Induction one is what is the, the, the legality, what are the roles and responsibilities of holding, either of being a local advisory board member, a governor, a trustee, or, or a trust member. An induction too should be, what is it to be a trust member or a governor or a trustee or a lab member in this, in this school? Because each school is different. There are no two trusts that are the same. There are no two schools that are the same. And, and actually inducting someone, um, and actually uh, it brings ownership, it brings accountability because you know that school far better. And you've just raised the point there that actually when, when some governors get inducted, they do so and it becomes challenge to the SLT because one of the three core functions of a governing body is to hold to account senior leaders. Um, but then if we don't induct governors properly, most people don't know what the three core functions of a governing body are or the three additional key feature functions of an academy trust or the seven Nolan principles of public office. If we don't know the 337, and I created a training program years ago called the 337 program, three core functions of a governing body, three additional functions of an academy, and the seven Nolan principles. Um, and I've been delivering that for years, but when you actually, if you don't induct someone properly, what they do is they hear that a critic friend is all about holding to account the SLT. And Sharon, you've just put something on the table that really does need conversation, wider conversation. We should be considering who our stakeholders are and stakeholder engagement and communication is key. So let's say, do we hold to account the local authority? Do we hold to account the police? Do we hold to account CAMs? Do we hold to account our local politicians? Do we hold to account? Do we hold to account? Do we hold to account? Because ultimately we all have a place sat around the table. We're all part of a jigsaw. And for a governor to just blandly and, and, and blindly just hold to account our senior leaders, perhaps what we need to be doing is holding to account and challenging effective questioning our wider stakeholders, so we can actually all get around the table and create, which is what one of our core functions is in, in governance, creating something bigger than the sum of the parts. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that speaks to the uh, ambassadorial role that we, that we hold on behalf of the school. I remember um, recently, and I'm going to put Birmingham on blast here, but Birmingham City Council changed their finance um, package, their software, and it created an enormous problem in terms of the maintained schools um, just getting their year end um, budget sorted. And so what we agreed as a governing board was that we were going to write to the local authority on behalf of the school, rather than you know resting on the head or leaving all the responsibility on the head, collectively as a governing board to raise our voice as the strategic body and challenge the local authority to say that this is unacceptable because sometimes I think that you know the the head plays a, a, a really unique role they are responsible for the whole school and accountable to the governing board and it can be very isolating mm -hmm. and then if they've got they're dealing with challenge on top of that you know um, it's important that we recognize we are there also to make sure that we are protecting and supporting our senior leaders when they are facing challenges that um, is having a massive impact on the school as, as a whole. And just going back to the inductions, one of the things that I do specifically, one of the reasons why I created the National Black Governors Network is because I recognize that it's not easy 
um, entering a space where you are the only one in whatever that may be under the um, Equality Act. Um, but specifically um, in terms of understanding what governance is in that, in that space. So almost doing the induction, the training, the prep, before they've even decided about whether they're going to become a governor or not. Because I found that that will aid in retention. And then once they become governors, we handhold them for the entire time because it's not easy to be in that space. And if you've got a, a strong induction process, which lasts longer than a quick meeting with the chair and the head and, and then sending them off to go and do training, that, that's not sustainable. And you will find that your retention will go down because like it or not, governing boards can be quite cliquey and it's the usual suspects that will challenge and talk the most and if you've got somebody who's who's new and quiet although I'm not quiet so I don't have that problem but you know new and quiet and shy um, and not really comfortable um, it can be really difficult to even raise your voice in that situation um, or to have your voice heard even if you've got a valid point to make or a valid question to raise so we do need to help um, and guide our new governors especially or our quieter governors um, in understanding how they can they can speak around the table and that takes time it may be a one-to-one -one with the governors I've done it as clerk I because I'm very because I do board observations and things like that I'm very aware of who's speaking around the table and I will have a quiet word with a with a governor outside of the meeting and guide them in terms of how they can question at what points they can they can get in um, because they just don't know and it's important that we don't just attend meetings rubber stamp decisions and then walk away and see you next term thank you very much we have to make sure that we that operating as one body um, you know is 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 actually do, delivered in practice. Sharon, Hannah, I, I've been holding to account and challenging the DfE for two decades about actually having some kind of formalised um, induction process and ongoing CPD, ongoing training for governors, because when you break it down into its, its smallest part, the governor's function in a school is a transient band of volunteers, if you actually consider it that way. And what happens is if we don't bring accountability and ownership, if we do not take ownership, of, of our decisions and ownership of that locality and, and improving people's lives. The minute a problem occurs, the, the transient band of volunteers can walk away at the drop of a hat and we leave the issue to the operational entity who will come in the very next day and solve it. And I see this, I see this in, uh, I saw it recently when I was doing a review of governance in a school that um, thought it was outstanding and because no, none of them had sat induction and because they, they believed what the head teacher was saying, the head teacher was leading them down a path because in his mind he was on guard and leaving his head because he was going to retire in about 12, 18 months time. So he was saying everything was fine. All the governors were just believing what was, what was being given to them. Actually, if they'd have checked the data and they were aware of the data, they were actually below floor. There were a school that was inadequate. It, it was a few years ago, so it was a special measures. So when actually what happened is when Ofsted walked through the door, all by one governor immediately resigned because they didn't want it on their CV, that they were governors of an outstanding school that had gone inadequate to a failing school. Now, this is a problem. This is a problem because accountability brings ownership and ownership brings accountability. So if we induct people, if we train people, and if people buy into it, you remember a few years ago when Lord Nash became Under Secretary of State, Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Education. Lord Nash, John Nash, had never been a governor. But when he walked through the door and took that role, he said there were 342,000 governors in the country and we needed to lose about 150,000 overnight because all we did was turn up three times a year. This was what he was saying. We turn up three times a year. If you're in a primary, we talk about what the summer fair looks like and what the school nativity looks like looks like and we put a hand up when the head teacher wants us to put a hand up and he said we need to stop that we need a more professional governing board with skill sets and accountability and ownership and the desire to leave the place better than we found it he just took a mallet um but he actually threw on the table a valid question about 
what was going on in the sector and how can we solve it? And we can only solve it by getting around the table and having the right people, like Governance for School, like Sharon and her companies, actually improving governance. Improving governance is key to improving outcomes for children. And it's the same, Sharon, you and I both see in the corporate world. Improving that governance function makes us make better decisions because we get upskilled and we actually improve our questioning, our understanding of it. And then what we do, we spider web that out into the rest of society. How good is that? Spider webbing out something into society that actually I've learned this from being a governor or have learned this from being an MD of a company and now I'm a governor. How we transfer that knowledge. Life is always about transferring knowledge and leaving the place better than we found it. And after we've gone, that knowledge then steps up and steps on. But we don't know that until we build a template. And this is what events like this is doing. It's building that template to have the right conversations and the right mindset. Uh, one of the things I always say is, right people with the right mindset and the right skill set sat around the table making the right decisions for the right reasons. Now that sounds easy, but actually there's a lot that goes into that because right decision and better decisions leads to better outcomes. So if we can break those constituent parts down, right mindset, right skill set, the right people sat there, not wearing it as a badge on the lapel, but because they want to leave society better than they found it. And then they make the right decisions, whether they're ideologically opposed to that decision they're taking, but they know it's right for the school now. They know it's right for the school for generations to come. And that by and large over the last 13 years has been the academization. People may be ideologically opposed to academies, but they may know that academization is right for that school, whether they're ideologically opposed to it or not, because this is the right decision potentially for generations to come, generations that follow us. We need a wider picture and a wider uh, a think tank at the top rather than just being blinkered to this critical friend malarkey. Um, on, the, on the back of that, Jeff, um, you know, one of the things I talk uh, to governing boards a lot um, on is succession planning. And it's the challenge to yourself as a governor. I never enter a space until I know, unless I know how I'm going to exit it. So if I'm invited to join a governing board, I have to know in my mind what my intention is for that school and how long I'm going to stay there. Because if we just year on year, um, term on term, just get reappointed, then in my mind, you become stagnant. By all means, take your governing experience, knowledge and expertise into another setting, but don't just sit in a school for three, four, five terms because you can. Because imagine if we had children entering in year seven and staying in year seven, never moving forward. And if, the, if every year a new cohort of children are coming in and leaving your school, why is it that the governing board is so stagnant and not moving? And especially because generationally there's a shift. If you don't know, I think it's year nine down, our generation alphas, they know nothing other than the digital space. So their mindset is completely different. And I think that's why we're seeing more exclusions, more suspensions, lower attendance, all of that, because we're dealing with a completely different generation of children and we need to understand that. And if we're in one place and we don't challenge our own selves and question ourselves as to why am I still on this governing body? What contributions am I making to this school? And is it benefiting the school or is it just satisfying my ego? Then we need to really think about that and look at that. And Jeff will know that part of having um, an external review of governance or individual appraisals or board observation, any of those external things that you invite in will give you that. I have literally gone into governing boards having observed them and everything and just hit them between the eyes with the realities because sometimes you don't know what you don't know and if you're in it you don't always see it and it's important that we have those honest conversations um, across the governing board and not feel that it's just the responsibility of the chair and the head to recruit I will always say if you're leaving 
make sure that you're you pull up as you rise up that you're bringing somebody in behind you so that you're not leaving the school to fill that vacancy especially if you've got a specialism if you've been safeguarding link governor for for eight years you can't just disappear and expect that gap to be filled um once you've gone we have a responsibility to act as a whole body for the benefit of the children that we serve sharon hannah how many times have we seen in in in, in, in schools succession planning is always around the head if it's done uh, it's, and sometimes it's around the chair Succession planning is a living, breathing, organic thing in any entity, especially schools. And, and what's happened is it's always been key. It's always been massively important. And, and for me, succession planning is what, what is it about that midday assistant where the kids absolutely adore him or her, you know, and, and, and that person's leaving. So even down to midday assistance is what succession planning should look like, because some things worked and succeeded. We don't get to that granular level of, of succession planning. The last 13 years and certainly the last five or six years of the growth of the multi-academy trust has brought it to, to, to a highlight now. Because when you've got a school joining a multi-academy trust with a board of trustees that sits above you, they may not know, you know, it, uh, uh, but, it, but it's right. The actual ethos, the identity, the mission, the vision, the values in those schools is right. What happens in five years' time if most of those trustees have gone and we bring in corporate mentality where they don't actually understand that those schools, they never engage with those schools, the whole premise of that academy trust could change. If so, uh, succession planning should, for me, be on every agenda. If there's nothing to report, you know what I mean by that, Sharon. If there's nothing to report, there's nothing to report. What it does do if there's nothing to report, it keeps it relevant in your mind we still have to think about succession planning. And this yeah. needs a more organic, living, breathing conversation. It has to be, be at the core of everything we do. When we walk away, those that follow us, do they have that moral compass? Do they have that skill set? Do they understand what the schools are all about? And that schools are, are different entities. They're not all a stick of rock schools. So what happens? How do we ensure that that mentality is not only protected, it's actually bettered by those who follow us because that's what life is. Life develops, the you know, society develops. And it, it, it hopefully what we what we get, what, what the goal is, is society improves with every generation. That's succession planning, and we need it on the agenda of all schools, not just trusts, but maintain schools because it, 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 it's a seamless transition. For me, it's more about evolution, not revolution, uh, uh, because you get more out of that. Um, so I agree with you completely, Sharon. Succession planning is, is hugely important and it's rarely done properly. I think, I think it's also important, and um, you know, I'd be doing um, my fellow governance professionals and clerks a disservice if I didn't bring them into the conversation and the, the, the value of the role that, that they play and um, understanding that your clerk is there. Your clerk is probably the only person around the table who knows all of your governors um, and I'm going to say on an intimate or personal basis because of the conversations that happen outside of the meeting um, whereas the, the chair may only engage with the, the, the governing board individual governors around that table um, or if an issue comes up your clerk is having those communications those conversations all the time there isn't a governing board that I've ever clerked where I didn't know exactly who was around the table, what their personalities were like, whether they were going to read the papers or not, whether they were going to turn up late or not, whether they were going to engage or not. So part of the effective challenge conversation um, should be um, including the clerk, and it could be a one-to-one -one with the chair, so that the chair is saying to the clerk, okay, from your perspective, and your experience and knowledge of this governing board, who are our ones to look out for? Who can we lean on um, when it comes to panels? Who can we um, communicate with in regards to um, succession planning? And your clerk will know this without question because that's the role we play when we look holistically and have that helicopter view of all of the gov governors around the table we are likely to know what's happening and we will see the strengths 
and the areas for development across the governing board and be able to say to a chair, okay, I think that so-and-so, um, they've got two years left of their term, um, they've just changed job and their new job um, is around um, social, social care um, in the community so we can lean on them to support the well-being and mental health work that we're doing. Your clerk will know that because we have conversations with our clerks that we don't have with anybody else. So do pull them in um, on, the, on the challenge agenda. Could I just pose a couple of questions from the chat? Thank you. I mean, the importance of a good clerk is really key. I think that that's absolutely evident and, and it can make all the difference to how a governing board functions. Um, we had a question from Emma Willis. Should a head be a member of the board? and present for the full meeting or should they step away for some of the meeting? What are your thoughts? Jeff, would you like to go on that one? But for, for me, I, I, I want a head sat around the table. Uh, for me in, a, in an academy trust, I want the CEO sat around the table. If it's right for them to sit on the table, absolutely fine. I, I wouldn't in, in, insist that the head sits on the GB, but, but but obviously in a maintained school, the head is there by virtue of being a head teacher, so they're ex officio governors. But for me, I always want the lead the lead operational person sat around the table with the same voting powers as my strategic entity. That's just my personal opinion. I'd want that for my CEO. I, I wouldn't want a group of trustees being able to to, to say we we take the vote, but you can't put your hand up um, because. The, there is usually one role, there are more roles, but actually the main role that's both strategic and operational in any school is the head, same in, the, in an academy trust as the CEO. So I would want that person to feel comfortable that actually they've got the same voting rights because they're living the life. I, I wouldn't want a, de a, 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 a gap between my operational and my, my strategic. Personally, it's just my personal opinion, I'd want the head sat around the table, I'd want my CEO sat around the table with the same voting powers. Uh, because I think there are more benefits than not, unless that individual does not wish to hold that position. And that in that respect, then, uh, it, it's personal preference, personal choice, that person should be able to say no. Um, I've, I've been in situations where um, a CEO has been part of the um, governing board um, with full voting rights and um, where they, they haven't been. Um, I... Whether they've got voting rights or not, um, I would say that they have to be there for the for the reasons that, that Jeff has, has mentioned. And um, we posed the question on our most recent podcast, I think that went out um, in September, um, to a CEO, a Matt CEO, um, Nick Hudson from, from Ormston Academies Trust, um, who's recently um, retired now. But... Um, one of the questions we asked him was, you know, um, how important it was for for him to be a full voting trustee, um, and and he was very clear um, on the importance of it from from him as a as a CEO um, having that vote around the table, um, whilst also bringing the the um, information um, operationally. Um, he wanted to 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 have that that um, recognition. Um, at a strategic level um, as well. I know in, in some, maybe some smaller trusts, it doesn't happen, um, but I think it does need to be a decision at, a, um, at each individual trust and what's right for them. And also not be afraid to, to change it if it's not working. If um, you've got a CEO or a executive head teacher who doesn't have that voting right, um, you know, then do consider um, bringing them on board in that in that respect. And also, I think um, ensuring that they um, take their skills and knowledge into other trusts or other governing boards, and okay. there is two way so that they are bringing um, back that that information of how things work in other settings. I think that is as important as well. 100% agree with you on that one, Sharon. Yeah, sharing the knowledge and understanding is really key. Um, another question we've got is, as a staff governor, so similar vein, how does one stay true to effective governance and challenge as well as being loyal to your head teacher? Tricky one. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> it, it, is, it is a difficult one. And this is where we, um, I would go back to the induction, the training, 
um, and the continuous um, support and understand that whilst you are around that table, you wear the title of staff governor, but you are there in equal measure to the governors. And um, it is important. And, and this also goes back to how I, what I was saying about not being confrontational and all of that. Um, the tonality of your of your questions, the, the the wording of your questions are really important. If you've, you know, at the end of the day, you're challenging your boss. Um, so, you know, um, you do want to, um, you know, um, be respectful in that regard, but equally, you don't want to use it as an opportunity to attack um, because that will have its own implications um, afterwards. And I think um, the more experienced you become, the more you prepare, as I say, preparing in advance um, and just digressing slightly. I was asked recently by a, a member of, of, of um, the Black Governors Network how to challenge about Black History Month coming up and it not being on the school calendar. And I said to her, ask the question as if it could be asked by any member of the governing body, not just you as a black person. Um, because that sort of then um, removes the emotion out of it and just the question stands on its own. So as a staff governor, I would say, ask a question that could be asked by any member of the governing board, not because of your knowledge of the school, if that makes sense. Yep. Anything to add to that, Jeff? No, uh, no. again, what Sharon says, it's like just, mm. it's like Sharon's just reading my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> On the same wavelength. Um, there's a few questions about clocks. I think you've, you've painted such a beautiful picture, Sharon, of this ideal world. Um, some schools are struggling to find clocks. It, it, there is a challenge there, definitely. Um, something that we get asked a lot of governors of schools, do you help us? Find, can you help us find clocks as well? And it's not something that we do. Um, somebody's asked whether, as a new chair, could, what can she do in the absence of having a clerk um, if she can't find somebody? And um, yeah, just lots of questions about where, where you can find clerks um, if, you're, if you're struggling. Any, any recommendations? Um, yeah, the first thing I would say, and I'm, and I'm probably known for, for this, is to look at your, um, your pay um, because notoriously in the sector, clerks are underpaid. <laughs> And um, the, um, don't just think um, that you can offer the same as what you were paying your previous clerk. The profession has shifted significantly and we as clerks and governance professionals need to know so much or everything about legislation and the law in relation to governance that it needs to be reflected in the pay. And anybody who wants to have a one-to-one -one conversation, then by all means, get in touch with me. I'm sure Liv will put my um, email address in the, in, in the in the response. But um, you can advertise with us. Um, we have a regular mailing um, where we promote vacancies um, just for the cost of membership. Um, so you can you can join NASC as an organization and, and, and the benefits related to that. And what you can do as a chair in the absence of a, of a clerk um, is definitely not get a member of staff to take the minutes because <laughs> you, don't, you definitely don't want to do that. But there may be um, clerking services that could provide a, um, a remote su a support service um, whilst you're trying to fill the gap. So again, um, if you want to get in touch with, with me, I, I know a number of, of um, remote, um, of, of clerking services that provide remote support um, if you can't find one locally. But some of the work that I, that I do is helping governing boards to understand that they have to give proper time um, um, and recognition to the clerking profession so that you understand exactly what you're, what you're looking for. It's never a case of, in my opinion, just term time only, because we do a lot outside of term. It's never just a couple of hours meeting, um, you know, minute in a couple of meetings and it's fine. As I've said earlier, we do so much more outside of that in the evenings and at weekends. And it's important to understand that clerks rarely just clerk in one setting. They may have, the most I've done is eight schools um, at any given time. And that in itself can generate, you know, um, 
three, um, you know, three times the sets of minutes that you would have um, if you just had one clerk. And so juggling all of that, the release of papers then impacts that clerk. So it's important that you know and understand exactly what you're looking for, but where we can help, we will do. Thanks, Sharon. We are really rapidly running out of time, I just noticed. Um, we've had such lovely positive comments in their feedback, uh, in the question and answers, and there are still shit questions to answer, I know. One thing about the um, the pay for, for clerks, uh, Governor Hub released a really good report around that, I think, earlier this year. So definitely worth looking at um, if you're struggling to find a clerk. Um, you know, that, that absolutely, it could be that you're not paying the right amount of money for the uh, absolute consummate professionals that they can be. Um, there's lots of questions around induction in the chat. I would just like to highlight our um, becoming an effective new governor e-learning, which we um, have on our website to act for people to access. Obviously, Governors for Schools volunteers get free access to Governor Hub Knowledge for 12 months um, when they start, but we also have that effective new governor e-learning. Doesn't replace, I have to say, the induction that schools should be doing and just should be doing. Absolutely, we strongly advocate that you should have a buddy when you start. You have to have that one-to-one, -one, that interaction on a personal level. But um, yeah, hopefully it answers questions about what their actual role is and what they should be doing. So please do point your um, new governors to that if, you, um, if you're struggling on that front. Um, it is, according to my clock, 11.15. So we will wrap up there. If there's one last comment from each of you, uh, thank you so much. I can't tell you, it was a fascinating session. Um, I wish we'd had longer. Jeff, is there one last comment from you? Yeah, I, I, uh, for me, is for, for, for those of us in governance, you should enjoy the role. It should not be a pain and it should not be a, 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 a badge on your lapel. This is about leaving society better than we found it. This is about leaving a legacy. We talk about the L word in my school, that, and, and the L word is, the, is, is legacy. It's leaving a legacy. It's when we walk away from this, we walk out with our head held high. That means that I have to step up to the plate. That means I have to get better. I have to work with other people better. I've got to improve. One of the things I say is if you've got a board of 10 people and you can actually improve each person's skill set and mindset by 1%, Evolution, not revolution. You have a 10% better skill GB at the end of it. Evolution, not revolution. You do that year in, year out, you're actually onto a winner there, to be fair. So for, for me, is governance is what you, you get out more than you put in. And for me, is wear it, wear it and champion this role because this role is very, very important to society. Thanks, Chair. And from you, Sharon. From, from me, I would say, um, you know, challenge yourself as well as challenging the school. Um, if you're coming up to your end of term of office, um, have a conversation with the chair, the head and the clerk in how you can support the recruitment of your successor um, and be very active in that so that we are filling gaps rather than just leaving them. Absolutely. Definitely. Thank you, Hannah, so much. Hannah, yep. Hannah, sorry, there are a number of questions there, which I think are really, really relevant questions in that chat. It would be nice for Sharon and I to have the ability to answer those for people. And then people after post this event actually get the answers to their questions because we've only been able to answer a few. If that that's a possibility, great. I think that Absolutely. would be a fantastic We'll download all the it. questions and, um, and we'll upload it when we upload the webinar, all of those answers. So thank you so much.